have to admit, uh, feel a bit ambivalent about uh, about talking more right now, and um, we are very conscious that it's a lot of content, and different people, you know, need different things at different times, digest differently, etc. So. Um, still feel a bit unsure, but I think I'm going to go ahead. Um, tonight, just so you know, th- there will be, there won't be so much content. There will, we'll, we'll, we'll have a different way of being together, so there won't be so much uh, stuff coming at you. Just so you know that. <clears throat> um, I want to see if, if, without talking too long, I can say enough to open up something else or another possibility. A little bit connected to some of the stuff I was talking about last night. When you're in love, uh, or when you love anything, when you're devoted to anything, when you're dedicated to anything, when something is meaningful to you in a deep way, there is fantasy and image operating there. There is an imaginal constellation and it's, it's, it's an imaginal perception of you in your life in, and of something in your life. In other words, it's not just intrapsychic. We're actually seeing others and self in, imbued with fantasy. So that the whole constellation of other or thing or object or event, work, other self, world and time, all, all that constellation is um, ignited in, in, as fantasy. And also the eros, the desire there. So this also applies um, to the path and to our uh, idea of awakening and our fantasy of awakening, fantasy of the Buddha, fantasy of teachers. All, all this is 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 um, brought in or engulfed in in the movement uh, in the beautiful movement of fantasy. <coughs> wherever there's love, wherever there's meaningfulness to us, wherever there's that devotion. Now, usual psychology says when you're in love for somewhere between three and six months, you're a little bit doolally, and there's the fantasies there, and um, the, we call it projection, uh, and there's all that. And what, what hopefully you make it through that period, and then you start to get real. Um, and then that's proper love. Um, but but is that actually what happens? Is that actually, so to speak, the best best thing to happen? Or is it more that in time, as things progress, there is this attunement to um, and attention to the relationship, the needs in the relationship, the 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 uh, different psychological patterns that one confronts um, and meets in oneself and in the other, and one cares for all that, and cares for the relating and the dialogue and the interactions and the patterns. But at the same time, um, the fantasies don't and shouldn't go away. They might change, they might deepen, they might become more subtle, more attuned to the let's use that word, realities, um, more nuanced, more sensitive. What happens if they go away over the months, over the years, in a romantic relationship? What happens? I mean, it might be the end of the relationship, people get bored, or it might be the relationship just finds another way of being together that's more about meta and friendship, but the eros is gone. How common is this? And the sex still might still be there, but the eros might be gone. So you can certainly have sex without eros. Um, same with the path. And when, we, when you love the path and you're de- dedicated to, to the path and whatever that means, 
um, there's uh, it's imbued with fantasy. What happens when our path is not imbued with fantasy? What happens to it? We we lose our inspiration. Um, <coughs> it becomes flat, or uh, we we go into a kind of fixation mode, and it becomes about measurement. How am I doing? I've heard about these different stages of awakening. I wonder, have I got that first stage yet? Am I? Where's? Where am I? And it's all about. It becomes fixated, reified, concretized, rigidified into a kind of movement of uh, or a, a relationship of ego measurement. For, this is this is what happens for people who care, for people who are. Uh, who love and invest themselves, how easily the eros and the richness and the, the beauty of the fantasy goes into craving and fixation. You understand? And probably everyone in this room knows that. Um, so what I wanted to do, just see if it's possible to open up for a little bit for, for us is... Um, talked about fantasies of the goal, if you like, fantasies of awakening, fantasies of the path and what the path involves, but also fantasies of the self on the path. In other words, like I said, when, when there's image, there's a whole imaginal constellation. It's not just that object or that other person. We forget to see it. This is so important. We forget to see sometimes the self needs to be included in that fantasy, is included in that imaginal constellation. What's going on with the self image in the good sense? What is, so to speak, the fantasy of the job of the self on the path? What's your job on the path? And what's the image of the self walking that path? Now usually in spiritual teachings, whether, whether they're Buddhist or other te- especially Eastern teachings, but um, they're taught uh, and framed um, in what we might call the medical model, a medical fantasy, the four noble truths. There's suffering, there's a cause of suffering, there is the possibility of the end of suffering, and there's the, uh, way, the way to the end of suffering. This this is actually a medical formula that the Buddha adopted at that time in India. This is how a doctor would talk to a patient. This is your problem. This is what's caused it. You can be cured um, if you do what I say. And uh, and this is what you need to do. This is the prescription. So we've inherited that. That's absolutely the most central thing in, in Buddhism. Four Noble Truths, and even if we don't think of the Four Noble Truths, I can't even, if someone says, what's the Four Noble Truths? Oh, uh, I'm <laughs> um, Even that where we've imbued completely, uh, or almost completely is what I want to say, this, this idea of a met, uh, what we're doing is reducing suffering. We're healing suffering. It's a medical model, and this is what we need to do. So that whole idea and fantasy, a medical fantasy, and some of you are teachers, so then you're not so much in the patient as in the doctor uh, role of the fantasy, um, that imbues our thinking. So much so that when a person talks about their practice or thinks about their practice or, te- or someone's teaching, it's, it's always somehow related to freedom. What's it going to help free from suffering? What's going to help alleviate suffering? Okay. Um, so that the whole way we frame to ourselves and to others and when, when we talk to anyone uh, and the... Um, uh, I can't read my notes there. The conceptual framework. Framework. <laughs> uh, the whole relationship with, with, with the path uh, and the self on the path and the job of the path and what practice. It's in this medical model, medical fancy model. Coupled with that in spiritual teachings of what we might call a second fantasy often is the religious fantasy. What's Now, by that I mean something relatively specific, but the, all these fantasies, I'm going to go through uh, quite a few and open this up a little bit, hopefully. And there's a lot of wiggle room in here. They're quite broad. But what's characteristic of what I'm going to call a religious fantasy is that I'm essentially, in my practice, the job of the self is to replicate as closely as possible, someone else's awakening. 
the Buddha, right? He, he had this awakening, and we're somehow trying to get something pretty close, or at least in the direction of that awakening. Does this make sense? The characteristic of, I mean, I use that word loosely, religions, and in a different way at different times. The characteristic of religion is the authority is in the past. You understand? The authority is in the past. We look to the past, look to the tradition, and the self in that is, with beauty, with reverence, filling out the fantasy there, replicating something. Um, uh, so, in a way, the, 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 the tra- <laughs> if you like, the, there's not much new in the religious fantasy. It doesn't, it's not that we're going to make new discoveries. We might open up the demographic of where we take the Buddha's teaching. So Mark is working in the prisons, taking, taking that to that demographic people work. Uh, Jamie's doing some wonderful work, you know. So we're opening up the demographic, but essentially the discovery is not new. We might use, um, oh, there's some research on what mindfulness does to your brain. But the, but this is just a kind of corroboration with culturally sanctioned ideation that supports what's already there. So there's nothing wrong with this. It's, this is this is all beautiful and uh, and and lovely. Well, I can't remember what I said in the talk last night, but um, I don't know if this is clear yet to to, to you. And um, you know, sometimes. You may have noticed this. What do you actually want in practice? What do you actually want? Now, at times, of course, you want, you want an alleviation of suffering, and that's why you're practicing. But all it takes is a little bit of honest, honest inquiry and reflection. And you see that some portion of the time, and maybe even a lot, that's not actually what you're primarily most, primarily most concerned about. Is something else. If we keep talking about it as if it's that, and keep prioritizing that, it's, it's as if we're sort of, I don't know, looking at the world in a kind of, looking at ourselves and the reality in a kind of blinkered way. We're not being psychologically honest, perhaps. So we use, we've been using this word soul making, but Sometimes one, one sees what, what actually one wants, whether one uses that word or not, is actually soul-making. I'm more interested in that at times than I am in the reduction of suffering. Is this making sense? Um, so also with the fantasies that go with, this is complex, there's like lots of pieces here that could fit together. The, the fantasies of the self can be larger than or other than the religious fantasy and the medical fantasy. And when I say something's fantasy, it doesn't mean it doesn't have any, quote, reality to it. Of course it does. So what, my, what I want to say is there are other fantasies possible. Of, of the self on the path and of the job of the self on the path, as, as much as there are of awakening and, and all of this. Maybe there are loads, you know, but if I uh, just offer some um, possibilities to open this up a little bit, um, one could at times have the fantasy of what, what am I, how am I actually seeing my practice? Who am I? when I'm practicing, what am I doing? And one might have the feeling that I'm researching. I'm a researcher. I'm a research scientist. Um, what am I researching? Well, it could be the end of suffering in the medical model. It could be I'm, I'm actually researching consciousness or I'm researching perception or I'm a phenomenological researcher or something. But then the whole job of the self and the fantasy and what gives juice and aliveness is is different there. Do you understand? It may be that it's bound up and, and there's certainly an overlap with this reduction of suffering and and what's the relationship with the Buddha's discoveries and teachers who are important to you, etc. But there's a different fantasy of self operating there. What's really exciting one and galvanizing one at times is this possibility of discovery. 
if we think about um, uh, like a scientific researcher, what's the relationship with time? So the re- religious fantasy looks backwards to replicate. Science uses the backward, rather the past, as a platform, but it's looking to the future. It is presumed in science that the science of a hundred years from now will know more than the science of a hundred years from the past. Not just the same. Do you understand? There's a forward. So what is it to, what would it be to have a fantasy of the self that you could make discoveries that are, that are not discovered yet? That you could be, um, researching in, in a way that's, that's moving forward. What is the job there? What is it that, um, what's the goal of that fantasy and the, the aliveness there? Um, it's not just the reduction of suffering. There's more, there's more involved there. It's not just functional in that way. Or there could be, so that's a third possibility, there could be the fantasy of the artist. I've talked about this elsewhere, but um, how does, what's the job of the artist? What's the purpose? If my, if my practice is art, I'm playing with these ways of looking, and, and really, like we t- called the last retreat, the poetry of perception. What, what's the, <coughs> why do people make art? Why do human beings make art? What's it for? Can't give it. Um, it's a rhetorical question because because what I want to say is, whatever answer anyone gives, and I'm sure there'll be loads of beautiful answers. You're never going to capture it. You're never going to f- um, capture that urge, that human urge to create and and to be involved in art. Art is always going to be bigger. Why does the artist do what they do? Why do human beings make art? In the broader sense, I mean art. What's the purpose of it? So if, if I'm fantasizing and feeling my, my practice as artist, what's the purpose of it? it can, I, can I keep trying to talk about it in the medical model, but actually I'm, I'm, something is really relating in a different way. What's the artist's relationship with the, mo- the movement of time, past and, 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 and future? So a, a, an artist who really gives himself to the art, most artists will want to um, explore the past, the past masters, so-called, etc., um, absorb those styles, replicate, but they don't want to stop there. And the whole idea with art is that it can go in a million different directions. It can, it, it's going to be new. So it's... it's um, uh, It's not predetermined even what, where it's moving. Does it? And what does the artist create? What does the artist make? What does the practice artist make? Artists, if you say artists make things or create things. What about an adventurer as another fantasy? What's the adventurer's relationship or fantasy of their uh, their place in time? The relationship with tradition. What's the a job of the adventurer? Uh, what's the goal? Does an adventurer have a goal, or is adventure the goal of the adventurer? What about the lover? Pra- fantasy of self on the path. What am I doing? My job is to be a lover. And what does that mean? What does it mean? My job is to be a lover. Lover of what? Lover of who? What is the, the, the job of the duty of the lover? And what is the sense of self and the sense of goal that the lover would have? <clears throat> I was working with someone not too long ago <clears throat> and um, inquiring into this with her. And she uh, 
actually, I think it was just in one session, and, and, and she talked talk about what's actually, when you feel most alive in practice, when you love it, when, when something is really ignited in you, what is it that you love at that time? What is the fantasy that's operating at that time? And, uh, and she said, and feeling into it, we did this a few times, there was different answers, and she said, um, uh, who, who are you in that? In other words, what's the fantasy of, I'm a landing place, she said. I'm a meeting place for all these um, threads and characters uh, from her history, from her life, from the culture, from so-called intrapsychic. And her job was to be that meeting place, that landing place, and just to open. You can hear that's a much more receptive fantasy, a much more uh, really b beautiful. That was her job. That was the fantasy of the self. And then a little while later she said, I'm a lover, a lover of psyche. I'm a lover of psyche. Very different, different uh, fantasy operating, really. So, <clears throat> say it again, where there's love, there is fantasy. So there is fantasy. In, in, in kind of as a ground of the path. Um, there's usually a mix of fantasies, in fact. Um, but the path is not just functional. It's not just, um, I'm accruing techniques to reduce my suffering. But sometimes we talk almost as if, or we present things as if, as if that's what's going on. I could have the, the, you know, one could, the, so all, all of this is good, it's all, it's all beautiful, and there's certainly not one that's better or right or wrong than another. If, if I am in that uh, reducing suffering fantasy, maybe it's, uh, or it's not just functional, it's not just utilitarian. utilitarian. Um, it's not just that. There's always, where we love it, there's going to be fantasy involved. There are people in the world, of course, you go to a class and you learn a couple of techniques about this or that to reduce your stress. But that person may or may not ever fall in love with practice. And if they don't, then it could be purely utilitarian. But, um, but when, once we start to get involved, then it gets imbued with fantasy. So that even that medical functional reduction of suffering fantasy gets imbued with other other fantasies. So, no right or wrong here, but can we see this? It's like it's almost like waking up psychologically a little bit. Um, can we recognize fantasy runs through our life, where there's meaningfulness, where there's etc. etc. Fantasy runs um, in in your life. Can we recognize, admit, acknowledge uh, the necessity of fantasy, the inevitability of fantasy, the <coughs> the beauty of fantasy, and the gift of fantasy? So, is you know, for a lot of people, this is a completely upside down way of thinking. Um, I, I'm feeling more and more like a, a kind of psychology that doesn't realize the necessity, inevitability, beauty, and gift of fancy, fantasy and eros. It, it almost like inevitably ties itself in contradictions. And people say one thing, but actually what's really driving them is something that they're not quite fully admitting or they have no conceptual framework to flesh it out and to support it. Um, there's almost a kind of not, not full integrity there by not admitting the place of fantasy and eros there. Um, so to me, I'm beginning to feel more and more like the psychology needs to be a bit more sophisticated to, to kind of really shine a light on something that's there anyway for us. It's just that we don't have words for it so much. <clears throat> So oftentimes we don't really realize, because we don't really think this way, we don't realize something that's already there in our life, coming, you know, ebbing and flowing, getting ignited and illuminated and then ebbing away. We don't realize that fantasy is involved almost as the ground of our path. The ground that we walk on, if you like, is fantasy. 
to a certain extent, we often don't realize what the fantasy is that's driving us, that's supporting us, that's inspiring us, or plural, what they are. And we don't realize the implications of all this. What are the implications of all this? I, I think there are many, um, and, and far-reaching. Um, so, you know, I'm certain that this is landing in different places. Um, I, I hope that for some people, hopefully now, but maybe sometime soon, um, you can sense that there's a whole other level of liberation possible when, when you, when you start to open this. A whole other level, a kind of meta level of liberation. I don't, can anyone get that? <laughs> On the other hand, some and, and some people might be like, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. And and other people might be, this is really, really disturbing. This is really disturbing. So I'm really aware of that and I want to be sensitive to that. Um, and it might be that, you say, well, if you're talking about being on the ground of fancy, aren't you then just pulling the rug out of, out of my whole path and my whole sense of what I'm doing? You're just saying it's fancy and the whole thing kind of crashes and deconstructs. Uh, and and it might be then we're left without any juice, inspiration, fire, because you've just lost the fantasy, and because you, you've realized it was fantasy, therefore it can't be real, therefore I can't trust it, therefore, etc. And it might be horrific, dis- disorienting, disconcerting, etc. At some point there will be, I mean, uh, that's not the point. Um, in other words, that's not the real possibility that I'm pointing to here. Um, there will be a reconstruction. What crashes, we, we, we construct as human beings, we fabricate, we fantasize. There will be a reconstruction. <clears throat> the question is, what's my belief about that reconstruction? Is it realist or not? So this is only horrific what I'm talking about if it's too realist. If I, if I really get this thing that fantasy imbues our life, imbues our love, and it, and it, it has its juice in the non-realism. If I get that, there's a whole other level of liberation here. <clears throat> um, is what's reconstructed as fantasy realist or not? Or is it, let's say, poetic, <coughs> poetic or not? <clears throat> and with all this, you know, one of the questions is, Am I locked in to a certain fantasy? Maybe I don't even realize. Am I just locked in to a fantasy? And maybe it doesn't really fit me, this fantasy. But but I'm just locked in. <coughs> and, and maybe there's just a kind of mono way of seeing. Or is there, can there be a flexibility here? Flexibility in, in the fantasizing. <coughs> So as with images, it doesn't matter, to me it doesn't matter at all, whether the fantasies that are supporting you, um, inspiring you, driving you, (coughs) drawing you on, pulling you on, um, it doesn't matter whether they're your inventions, so to speak, or your discoveries, or whether they're just received fantasies. That's actually irrelevant. It doesn't matter at all whether you read them in a book, heard them, got communicated by a teacher or something or other. And the question, as always, is, is it, are they soul-making? Are they soul-making? <clears throat> In other words, do they open up the inspiration, the ignition, the, the dimensionality, the depth, the beauty, the meaningfulness, etc.? <clears throat> the eros. So, what is going on? What is inspiring? What is igniting? What is beautiful? Etc. When you feel most alive in practice. What is it really? At those times then, what is it that <clears throat> that makes you feel alive? What is it that you love? 
fan there's a lot there's a lot of room here so i've just i think i ran through six but there's all kinds of possibilities and then what does this particular fantasy that I mean what what how does it fantasize um an ending or is there an ending is there a completion so when i asked the uh the the woman she said i'm a lover of psyche i'm a a meeting place for all these threads i said and is there a completion to that is there an end no no end is that a problem? <laughs> Whereas other fantasies is a problem. We're definitely wanting to arrive somewhere. Or are we? So wrapped up in all of this is even, even the idea of, is there an end? Is there a completion? Does this make sense, what I'm talking about? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to stop there. We just wanted to um, see if this could be opened up a little bit. And uh, maybe just put those see- seeds out, you know, just spr- sprinkle some seeds and they land where they land, to borrow someone else's phrase. Um, and we may revisit this and, and work with it as an exercise. We, we may, we'll see. So, but, but this is to me that there's, uh, I don't, I don't know if it even makes sense, maybe, but as I said, that there's something Im- immensely uh, potent here, uh, potentially at least in, in, in this kind of re, re looking or, or opening up, let's say. Um, so we may revisit it. But I just wanted to kind of scatter some seeds a little bit. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers 